Hello, my name is Monica Lee and I'm from Brescia University College. Today I'm going to talk to you about identity in Shelley's Epipsychidion. Conceptions of identity in Friedrich Schelling and Percy Bysshe Shelley. And I'd like to begin by pointing out that Shelley writes about our normal ideas about individual identity as an epistemological mistake. He writes, the words I, you, they are not signs of any actual difference subsisting between the assemblage of thoughts thus indicated, but are merely marks employed to denote the different modifications of the one mind. If taken literally, this statement radically challenges a normative conception of individual identity. Shelley suggests, quite unusually, that humans are not separate from one another, except on the level of appearances or in the various modifications of the one mind. Moreover, he advances an idea that embodiment is incidental such strange assertions flying in the face of other romantic theories of the self, the egotistical, sublime, Kantian subjectivity. They deserve our critical attention in order to explain aspects of Shelley's 1821 poem, Epipsychidion. In my argument, I explore the ontology of identity through a German idealist lens, specifically Friedrich Schelling. Now, I think it's important to note at the outset that our contemporary notions of identity having to do with age, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, race, political affiliation, etc., are not going to be any help with this German idealist lens. In fact, Schelling's idea of identity is radically different from our contemporary understandings of the way in which the word is commonly used. In the first part of my argument, I will cite concepts from pre-1809 or early Friedrich Schelling, which correspond to figurations of identity in both Shelley's long poem, Epipsychidion from 1821, and his essay, Fragment on Life. We will examine after that how the late Schelling's idea of consciousness also emerges in Epipsychidion and in Shelley's explicit comments about identity in his essay on life. And finally, at the end of my paper, I hope to gesture toward understanding a late romantic conception of identity as absorption, but also as bound to Schelling's Ungrund, or the irrational, the dark, and the abyssal. So to begin, in Shelley's preface to Epipsychidion, he creates a deceased fictional self, whom he calls my unfortunate friend. And he proceeds to address his poem to quote, a certain class of readers for whom the poem is, quote, sufficiently intelligible, while he disparages a, quote, certain other class of readers for whom it will forever remain incomprehensible from a defect of a common organ of perception for the ideas of which it treats. Stuart Peter Freund, among others, cites the preface's common organ of perception as the mind and the defect as the tendency for some minds to understand only the materiality of sensual love rather than the ideality of the poem's platonic or Dantean love. In other words, critics, not just Peter Freund, but others as well, commonly observe a distinction between the materialist and idealist philosophy in the preface and in the poem, a distinction which I will argue the poem ultimately repudiates in a Schillingian manner.
Friedrich Schelling's conception of individual identity is difficult to summarize because it changed over time. Yet, all his writings on the subject complicate a German idealist tendency to view the subject as a stable self. In his first major philosophical work on the I, Schelling declares, my ego contains a being that precedes all thinking and representing. In this image, the ego acts as a container for absolute being. When the speaker in Epipsychidion writes, we shall become the same, we shall be one spirit within two frames, oh, wherefore two? We can detect a similar sense of individuality as contingent. For the individual identity seems here, as in early Schelling, to be a deviation from reality or a degeneration of the absolute. Prior to 1809, Schelling's sense of what Shelley Epipsychidian deems an unentangled intermixture reads thus. All that is, is to the extent that it is one, namely that it is the eternally self-same identity, the one that alone exists and that therefore is all that can be known. According to this perspective, the merging of self with other is nothing more than seeing into a, the life of things as they are in the absolute. What Shelley and Schelling both call the one, or what Hegel critiqued as the night in which all cows are black. In this context, Shelley's apostrophe to Emily I am not thine, I am part of thee, is not merely the tired trope of seduction, but it is an articulation of a romantic and German idealist metaphysics which privileges transcendent collective identity over individuality. In Epipsychidion, this metaphysics is enacted through absorption of self and other, both of which are illusions into a greater whole. This conception of identity as absorption helps explain why Epipsychidion extends beyond a desire for unification between speaker and prospective lover to include other identities as well, Mary's for instance. And I quote, or that the name my heart lent to another could be a sister's bond for her and thee, blending two beams of one eternity. In this metaphor, Mary and Emily are two beams of the absolute or one eternity. Divisions of the one spirit into individuals are not real, but represent what Shelley calls outlines. One intense diffusion, one serene omnipresence whose flowing outlines mingle in their flowing. Schelling problematizes Cartesian dualism in his nature philosophy. He wrote, the I think I am is since Descartes, the basic mistake of all knowledge. Thinking is not my thinking and being is not my being for everything is only God or the totality. As far as we know, Shelley never read any Schelling, but in Epipsychidion, he posits an absorption of historical particulars and personal identities into just such a totality, not God in Shelley, but one serene omnipresence. And that ends the first pillar of my argument showing the transcendental idealism of early Schelling in Epipsychidion. The second pillar of my argument looks at the post-1809 Schelling, whose turn away from the absolute may provide an even better reading of Epipsychidion, especially later sections of the poem, because Schelling's focus on relationality 
and a psychodynamic theory of personality moves even further away from a deceiving dualism, what he calls that infinite fracture of crystalline, the crystalline monolith of reason into the endless repetition of finite subjects and objects. What begins as a positing of unity in Epipsychidion necessitates not just the absorption of the self into the other, but ultimately the obliteration of both. One hope within two wills, one will beneath. Two overshadowing minds, one life, one death, one heaven, one hell, one immortality, and one annihilation. Woe is me. The later Schelling after 1809 explores the dark and unknowable recesses of consciousness in ways which validate poetry and dream. John Keats seems to have thought similarly in writing that a poet is the most unpoetical of anything in existence because he has no identity. He is continually in, for, and filling some other body. The poet has none, no identity. In Keats, therefore, we read a second generation romantic conception of identity as a kind of absorption into some other. A conception which Shelley radically extends not simply to the poet, as in Keats, but to all human subjects. Moreover, in the essay on life, Shelley confirms an anti-individualist ontology by exploding the Cartesian dualism on which it rests. The difference is merely nominal between those two classes of thought which are vulgarly distinguished by the names of ideas and of external objects. Pursuing the same thread of reasoning, the existence of distinct individual minds similar to that which is employed in now questioning its own nature is likewise found to be a delusion. Earl Wasserman writes that Epipsychidion requires two modes of a single self. The self in existence and the infinite self. And in Schelling's terms, these correspond to the unbedingt, the unconditioned, and the bedingenum, the conditioned. Epipsychidion is less a love poem than it is a poem gesturing toward the unconditioned, reaching. The inseparability of self and other in this poem expresses itself in unity, one intense diffusion, a phrase whose enjambment enacts the separation within the unity. The diffusion by which this unification occurs is an absorption whose flowing outlines mingle in their flowing. The absorbent qualities of selfhood blur individuating boundaries. We shall become the same. We shall be one spirit within two frames, oh, wherefore two. If we return to Shelley's essay on life, we see that he understood this conception of selfhood not figuratively, but literally. He writes, the words I and you and they are grammatical devices invented simply for arrangement and totally devoid of the extents, intense and exclusive sense usually attached to them. Hence, the outlines of the two spirits are analogous to arrangement and organization, or organization, which happens to be a key element of the organic in Schelling, just as the arrangement in Shelley's discussion of pronouns accounts for the illusion of individual organic identity. More than analogous, elements in Schelling explain epistemologically a theory of identity 
which subsumes the particular into the collective or the relative into the absolute self. Like Shelley's, Schelling's idealism does not dispute empiricism, but synthesizes it to nature, which Schelling describes as a poem that lies enclosed in a secret, wonderful script. In Schelling's freedom essay, as well as in the ages of the world, love is an expansive force that embraces otherness and hence seeks to create more and more differences which bind the self and its other together in relative identity. The opposite of love would be the contractive force of the ground of existence, which symbolizes ego or selfhood as it desires to be all in itself and hence negates all otherness. When Shelley invokes love toward the end of Epipsychidion, he does so to affirm the soul as this immersive and absorbent mode of being not limited by the ego. His invitation to merge self and other is an affirmation of a wesen, Schelling's German word for being or essence. Let us become the overhanging day, the living soul of this Elysian Isle, conscious, inseparable. One. Yet behind this absolute being or self, there is darkness and a threat represented at the end of the poem by one annihilation, woe is me. The winged words on which my soul would pierce into the height of love's rare universe are chains of lead around its flight of fire. I pant. I think, I tremble, I expire. These lines are followed by an ellipsis before the final dedication of these weak verses. I see a parallel between this threat and what Schelling calls the indivisible remainder a concept which refers to a realm of irrationality and darkness below the surface of an existing cosmos, which is comprehensible. In the essay on life, just after the passage on pronouns, which Shelley says are totally devoid of the exclusive and intense sense usually attached to them, Shelley intuits what looks like Schelling's indivisible remainder. He writes, we are on the verge where words abandon us and what wonder if we grow dizzy to look down the dark abyss of how little we know. Or, in Schelling's words, the understanding is born in the genuine sense from that which is without understanding or the unground, ungrund. Without this preceding darkness, creatures have no reality. Darkness is their necessary inheritance. You'll note that there's a photo of cows uh, in the night, black cows in the night as a playful allusion to Hegel. Knowledge of the self, therefore, cannot be achieved through consciousness, for it also has an irrational and preconscious underpinning. On this final point, Shelley and the late Schelling concur about the importance of the dark abyss. Art derives from and expresses the irrational unground of a consciousness. In conclusion, Shelley's explorations of identity are neither Plato's world of ideal forms, nor Wordsworth's egotistical sublime, nor even a Kantian subjectivity. Epipsychidion and Shelley's prose excerpts 
propose a theory of identity which subsumes the individual self by diffusing the outlines between subject and object and dissolving the particular or the conditioned into the imminent or unconditioned. However, the absolute or unconditioned identity from early shelling changes in later shelling to one which acknowledges the merging of contingent beings in nature, like Shelley's one hope within two wills, one will beneath, and reminds us of Schelling's statement in the Freedom Essay that willing is primordial being. Kipperman writes about identity in Schelling. The self can never actually clarify itself to itself. There will always intrude a dark, unconscious remainder. Today, I have argued that individual identity in Epipsychidion is first absorbed, then obliterated in a dark Schillingian abyss beyond philosophy, beyond linguistic organization, and beyond conscious awareness. Thank you.